Well, uh, Jerry Patch, uh, Mame Hunt, when we were putting this uh, together, uh, this was way back. We had two, we had a false start on this one, and some of you who are listening out there today were part of the false start, uh, because where it actually landed, uh, you weren't able to uh, join us, and I apologize for that. But when we were first starting to work on it, uh, Mame Hunt was the one who said, well, just ask Patch. He knows the entire history of this conversation. So I'm just going to ask Jerry Patch He's one question. <laughs> I'm just going to ask Jerry Patch one question. Tell me the history of this whole thing. No. Um, but, but we're very blessed that you took the time uh, to be here, and we're willing to launch us uh, down the history path. Uh, Jerry, you're currently, uh, what's the title at Manhattan Theatre Club? Director of Artistic Development. Great. And you've been at Manhattan Theatre Club for? About four years. And then you were at uh, the Old Globe for a year? Or no, I was there four years. Four years. And, and then, but South Coast was uh, before that. For about 34 years. Yeah. Yes. So let's go back to the beginning of South Coast. Your, well, your beginning at South Coast. Uh, because what I really want to get at in this conversation is where, how the notion of the literary office has evolved uh, from your perspective. You've been in a long trajectory with it. You were in the early days of it uh, as, a, as a concept in the theater, and then you've been in multiple institutional settings uh, around it. So I want to go through that whole journey. Well, this would begin back in the 60s when South Coast started, and uh, there was always a thought of doing new work in this company. And, and, and again, this is as we sit in a structure like this, this is not how it was. Uh, there's a famous SER story about touring in a station wagon, which we did. Uh, the, everybody had a day job, everybody. And so all the work of the theater was done at night and on the weekends. Uh, it was the 60s, so most of us were married with kids in our 20s. And uh, that took a toll uh, in terms of putting that together. So when, particularly, I, I worked with young people at MTC and other places, uh, you're all coming into a world of institutions that didn't exist when I started. And another thing that didn't exist in the, in the institutions that were there, for the most part, were literary offices. Uh, I think if plays came into Arena Zelda Rhythm, or Nine of Ants in Houston, or, or you know, whoever was running regional theater, Blau and Irving in San Francisco, and there wasn't a literary office per se, and there wasn't a literary office at South Coast. Um, the way we got one, which is, I think, around 1972 or three, a play had come into the theater. This, I don't think this is apocryphal, but I have no first-hand evidence of it. And uh, it was declined and sent back to the writer. And the play was American Buffalo. And uh, so then it was decided, well, maybe somebody who has some background in this field. <laughs> so my background was in contemporary American fiction and poetry, and not at all in theater. I had majored in what was then called speech and theater way back. Uh, that was right before my apprenticeship with Lessing. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I had come into it because uh, I was married to a woman. Who I don't know what that means. means. Your, your apprenticeship with Lessing. Gospel Blessing? You don't know who he is? Yeah, but... It, yeah. Oh, so you did an apprenticeship? It was a joke, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway. Uh, channeling. Maybe. Yeah, so, so I started reading plays. And uh, in, in terms of setting up a literary... I mean, my job was just to pass judgment on plays. Uh, I had no training in uh, particularly the literature of the theater. Uh, other than what I'd gotten as an undergraduate, or uh, certainly not in any kind of literary management or dramaturgy, even though I was performing that function with playwrights that came into the theater. And uh, my longtime pal, John Glorick, joined us in 1984. And John was a huge, you know, move up for us because he had gone through the Yale dramaturgy program and knew what that actually was, as opposed to the faking it that I've been doing for about 12 years. So uh, it, it worked out very much to the theater's advantage, and I think to mine, because he taught me a, a great deal as well. So I mean, I, the point 
to carry, I think, is that these things didn't exist. I think the first graduating class out of Yale was 74, and the first two graduates were Ann Catania, who's still at Lincoln Center, and Russell Vandenberg, who for a long time was at the uh, Mark Ticket Forum, I think for 15 years, uh, went to, I think, St. Louis, and then North Light, and the last I heard Russell's uh, teaching at the University of Kentucky, if he's still there. But, uh, Russell was known for two things, I think. Uh, uh, one was the famous quote, no kid ever grew up wanting to be a dramaturg, uh, which has changed. Uh, we hired Jen Kiger out of ART, and Jen Kiger grew up wanting to be a dramaturg, and, and John and I think noted that, gee, the world would change. Uh, the other thing Russ said, which I think is very apt about dramaturgy, is uh, when you give a note is more important than the note. And that's a good thing to know if you're working with writers and directors. So. Let me come back to something here uh, before we lose it. So you, American Buffalo came into SDR. Somebody who knows uh, read it and didn't find it compelling for them. And then they saw this hit, the success of it, and they realized they had missed something. Right. And so, and, and when they came to you, were they already <laughs> creating it as a literary office? No, it was. You have to understand, nobody was getting paid, right? There was a company. Okay, somebody's got to read these plays. Who can read the plays? Who have we got? You know, well, the actors didn't want to read the plays. The directors wanted to direct the plays. So I was the guy. Yeah, and you I were mean, reading literally by sort of reduction. All new plays at that point? Yeah. Or was it because that's what SCR was doing? Yeah, and then ultimately, uh, no, we, we also were doing revivals. but. Uh, uh, as I gained some kind of credibility with Ems and Benson, who were running the theater, then I would be asked to, well, we're thinking about doing this one next year. What do you think? And so I, I would be asked to read that as well. And one of the things that uh, I should have brought up with Polly, and I mentioned to David, is this idea of part of the literary management, dramaturgy. We've been talking all about new work, but for those of us who work in institutions, there's season planning, which is a, a big function. If I work for Arena, my job is to give Molly choices. So, and that's just not new plays. So, so there's that aspect as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're in there, and you're uh, you're reading plays and helping uh, South Coast Ems and Benson and whoever else does directing, I guess, uh, find new work that for production, right? Yeah, and and part of it was. A commitment that evolved in the 70s, which was if South Coast Repertory was going to become something, because Gordon and his behemoth was 35 miles north, and, and we weren't going to outproduce the taper and the center theater group. So what, how could we make a name for ourselves? And uh, Jack O'Brien was down the freeway in San Diego, and along with Dez at La Jolla. So what could we be? And we decided in about 1978 or 9, we'd shoot for new plays. And then the commitment became institutional through the board in, I think, 80, 81, something like that, that we would try to gain an identity nationally as a producer of new plays. And that would involve creating relationships with writers. Uh, that's one thing we started off very early with, was a belief that we wanted to be involved with writers over a period of time, not just project to project. And, uh, and also that we should commission work from those writers, and that we needed to raise the funds to do that. And, and one of the things I think that David and Martin did that uh, probably served South Coast as well as anything was creating an endowment that turned out money for play development every year, and that could only be used for that. And that's been in place, John, for what now? Well, right when I arrived, baby four is so that kind of thing. Yeah, it came online in 84, but now it's a substantial amount of money, it turns out. I, I don't even know. What yeah, it yeah it, it's into six figures, a good six figure amount annually. So uh, we were commissioning 10 to 12 plays a year, I think. As the, and, yeah. and as the literary manager, were you, you were advising on which playwrights to. Yeah. Uh, not, so you're coming at the <coughs> plays and you're saying this is a writer to, to develop. You should, a yeah, I mean. <laughs> It helps if you have a relationship as, as we did. I could go in to Ems or Benson and say, you have to read this in 48 hours. And they would read it. 
but you can't do that three times a week. You have to, you know, you do that six times a year, maybe. Uh, and so when you really get something that you want to move on, you do it. The rest of the time, uh, as I say, John was a tremendous addition to our staff, and, and so uh, John became a literary manager. I was the dramaturg because they didn't know what else to call me, and, and so uh, the four of us met regularly on, on plays and investigated stuff, you know, writers. And we would go to uh, the O'Neill, Sundance, uh, other places, covering the ground, if you will, of where new plays gathered, and trying to find writers with whom we related and felt about. And how many we, uh, scripts were you reading in through the submission policy? Was it open submission at that point? I think we were just starting <coughs> on but we had, there were years, where we had something called a California Playwriting Competition. That doesn't sound like much, you had to be a California resident, except there were, you know, 27 million people in California, 24.6 of whom wrote plays. <laughs> <laughs> and you would see stuff come in that clearly had been, been mimeographed in 1952, and this kind of thing. Every year the same plays would come in. But uh, you would get, what, 12, 1,300? plays a year, 1,400, something like that, but it did go down once we got rid of that competition, but it was a lot of plays. At what point, because you just did it here uh, a minute ago before I asked that question, at what point did your job move from that part of the literary life, where you came in to say, oh, well, here's the relationship between what's written on this page and the world of the literature, or coming out of fiction, you were looking at it from that lens. Uh, at what point did it move from that as the primary focus of helping them understand uh, the literary nature of the place to dramaturg of new place as a role for you? It, 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 it's not something that I could point to. You know, in 1983, October, I remember, you know, this kind yeah, of right. thing. <laughs> it, it, it's, it just happened. And, and you, you sort of... Uh, it's interesting as I listen to the desire for a protocol, the procedures, and dramaturgy that uh, I don't know that you can do that. Every writer is different. Every play is different. And, and to the extent that there is a protocol, one thing I, that, that I came to understand was one size did not fit all. That you had to treat every writer differently according to who that writer was, where their play was, what they thought their play was, and that's the first, well, the first thing you had to do was get them to trust you. And that took three, four months, right? Uh, something like that. It's, they knew you were on their side, you wanted to do their play, you were going to promote them to the people who could say yes or no. Then second, you had to understand what they were trying to do to play. Uh, I'm, I'm always fond of quoting the late Romulus Linney, who probably half the people in the room have heard this, but Romulus talked about the three primary drives of mankind, the drive for food, the drive for sex, and the drive to rewrite someone else's play. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, for you younger ones, Romulus was Laura's father. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Anyway, uh, there, there, there's some substance to that. And, and you know, the reason Richard and, and uh, Terence and, and the people who wrote those anti-dramaturgy articles wrote them is that there was some truth to them. You know, uh, I, I don't know that you can make a procedure for working on a play like that. You, you have to first develop the relationship with the writer and then understand what the writer's play is. And, and then you are in the room to serve the writer if you are doing dramaturgy. So uh, David and I talked the other day, uh, I was deposed in the rent suit uh, about uh, should the drama critic get paid and my first question was was she paid a salary and he said yes and I said then she deserves nothing because if she chose to write material that got produced that was part of what she chose to do as part of the job she was paid for but you're in the room to help the writer make the play better and I mean part of, of, of what you learn in this because I've been the head of two organizations, uh, the artistic head of the Old Globe and, and the Sundance Theater Program for a while. And I've been what I would call a military staff officer, which is where I, 
uh, now I work for Lynn Meadow, I work for David Anson, Mark Benson. And uh, you have to be willing to be satisfied with a staff position. And that's something you need to find out about yourself, I think, is are you comfortable not being the person who pulls the trigger? If you need to be the person at the center, and John would back me up, David Ems couldn't work in the theater if he wasn't running it. You know, I mean, that's just, and Dave, I'm, I would say that to his face, he knows that. You, you know? just did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching, Dave. Yeah, no, and, and to our benefit, because he was very good at it. But he is one of those guys that if he's in the room, he's got to be running. And, and uh, uh, if you're going to work for him, you have to be willing to take that position. So that idea of serving somebody else is, is not something that everybody in theater is coming But, okay, and I'm going to keep coming back, but you moved into that role, which I think it's easy to acknowledge, and, and I, I'm honored to be able to acknowledge. You're one of the best at that. And, and it's, it's a tremendous uh, thing you've done, it's a tremendous body of work that you've done as that dramaturg. Uh, and, but there was a literary component to your job in the beginning. And did that, did that then become, was dramaturgy the point of that job? Or did that job still need to be done and someone else did it? Was that then John's job? What happens, because we slide so fast, I'm trying to figure out what happens. John, I, I can't remember that I had any system when you came to work there, did I? I mean... We still don't, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no, John, John was much... I mean, really, it was organized. He'd been trained to run a literary office. I hadn't. And, and my thing was to go out and find writers I liked, to bring them into the theater, and hope Dems and Benson liked them, too, and then support them. And, and that was essentially my procedure. So, to this day, and I... I you know, it's really interesting to me. I was talking to David earlier. Uh, maybe this is a place to get into this. Uh, Manhattan Theater Club is in there. Yeah. It's a machine, man. I mean, everybody there is working. And I'm used to walking into offices. You walk into an office at Manhattan. You know, <laughs> it's, really, it's all done on email. And even the kids who work for me now, it's hysterical. I'll come to their desk and they all start typing like, here comes the wind bag. Here comes the guy who's going to take up 10 minutes that I don't have. And I get it. You know, everything is done to maximum efficiency, and it's terrific, and I can't work that way. You know, I, I mean, I just, I, I do the best I can, but it, it's, it's sort of, I'm going uphill all the time. I need time to talk. I mean, a, a guy who's done it better than I have, who has my disease, is Oscar Eustace. Uh, and, I, and I think Oscar and I, uh, who work together a lot at Sundance, uh, have a similar approach in, in dealing with playwrights, which is we like to spend a lot of time talking about the plays. And, and in, in, on the rare occasions now when I see him, it's one of the things he complains about, that essentially he's running meetings and raising money, and you do less art. And for those of you who, you know, going back to that point about uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to be the person that pulls the trigger? I, I think Molly would tell you, and other people in the room as well, you give up one hell of a lot to be an artistic director of a theater. That a ton of your time every day, it was one of the most frustrating things I had at the Globe, was that whatever fire happened that day torched about 65% of what I had planned to do. And you have to take care of whatever comes up. So and so just got a series. This this guy's in jail. How do we get him? All that stuff. You it has to be dealt with right now. And the time that you thought you were going to get in a room with artists just keeps getting less and less. So to have the job I have now, Roman Meadow has to do that, or, or, or Mandy Greenfield. Uh, they do that kind of work, and I'm really lucky, and I see Mandy looking at me like enviously, you know, <laughs> even, even though she's much more prominent in the organization than I am. So it's, it's a good thing to think about. What do you want to do? What, what kind of day do you want to have in the arts? You have, um, you brought up you and getting nowhere near what you want. No, no, I, I keep pulling you back. Okay, okay good. <laughs> Yeah, I, you brought up MTC, and, and what you and I have talked about this uh, prior. And, uh, Manhattan Theater Club reads everything that, uh, that you can find, basically. Reading 
It, 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 when I say it's a machine, uh, we have, I think there are five of us in the literary office, and uh, we cover everything. If it's in English and on a stage on planet Earth, we pretty much know about it. And uh, before it happens. And what's driving that? Uh, Lynn Meadow. And what's uh, driving uh, Lynn? Well, Lynn, <clears throat> I think, you have to understand, uh, and this is, I think, not applicable, but it's, uh, you know, Rafi uh, was our literary manager, so he understands this. I mean, there's a tremendous pressure that no rock in the stream bed goes unturned over, right? You have to look at everything. And part of that goes back to the, a time when uh, Manhattan Theater Club basically had its pick of the litter on new plays out of, particularly out of London, uh, but from the United Kingdom and other places, because uh, there were three big nonprofits in New York, and Andre Bishop was essentially the new work he did was largely written by his friends, who were great friends, people like John Ware and Wendy Wasserstein, Chris Durang, and uh, Todd Haynes was running a revival theater, and so Manhattan Theater Club was the new play venue of size in New York City that was nonprofit. In the last 15 years, that has changed. Uh, Todd and Andre are producing new work in a big way. And a whole bunch of tech money, biotech money, divorce settlement money, you name it, has come in, right, Kristen, in, in, into New York. And people who, who want to stand on the stage and, and be there for the Tony. And they're all looking for new work. So as, as that has increased, Lynn has, you know, gone more and more to the whip, I think, in the literary office to, to get there first, to find it. The big sin is not only to miss it, but not to be there early. So, because it's competitive. It's competitive as hell. So, and if, all right, so, if, if two um, less institutional bound questions. One, let, let's go here first. If the push now, I mean, we haven't really defined it yet, but I, I'm, I'm anxious about getting my questions to you. So let's just say that the literary office, and we'll do it all the rest of the day and tomorrow, but the role of the literary office is changing. It's, uh, we're going to talk tomorrow about sprawl and, and the amount of different things that the literary office is now expected to accomplish. So there are, there are a number of people in this room, and myself among them, who feel like, let's figure out what's, what's the 20th century, what's the literary office of the 20th century. So if I put to you, we're going to tip over the tub of the 20th century, the literary office of the 20th century. And we're going to write it back up and make it the 21st century. What would you say is the baby that we're looking for? What's the, what's the, what are the critical things about the role of the literary office in the health of the field? And I'm not even talking about the health of the institutions, but in the health of the field. What are the critical elements of the literary office? And if we could separate for the moment dramaturgy, let's see if we can even do that. I don't know if we can. But, but in terms of the office itself, what would you say would be the critical functions, the critical um, interventions or contributions of the literary office in the theater that would be at risk if we said, let's just get out of my piece of paper and start? Well, I, I think the great thing that we have going for us now is all of this technology. And, you know, David was showing me the tweets that have come in, you know, from the last hour and this kind of thing. I, uh, I have no idea how to do any of that. And uh, my next door neighbor, Tom Wilk, was, uh, who passed away, uh, left an audio tape. He was <coughs> dying of pancreatic cancer very fast. And they played this. His funeral was at the Nixon Library because he served President Reagan and President Bush in the White House. And uh, he, he said on the tape, he said, God, I'm dying at just the right time. He says, because I don't get any of this stuff. <laughs> You know, it, I would just be a fumbling bumbler if, if I stayed on. And I, I, I think that's, uh, you know, I can identify with that. But it's terrific. It's amazing what we get now uh, out of technology and out of the Internet. Uh, uh, part of what makes um, what the literary office at FTC uh, as functional as it is, is, is the capacity for it and new websites coming on every month that give you more and more information. So from the standpoint of literary management, you know, knowing what's out there, uh, sharing stuff. I mean, Christian and I compete. I, you know, we don't share a hell of a lot. Uh, but but the, the uh, you know, John and I talk. 
because he's 3,000 miles away. And, and, you know, so there are those kinds of relationships that you have. But what you can get, you know, just out of the technology is terrific. I think dramaturgy is another thing completely. That's the baby that I would be concerned with, and is that the way I see office procedures protocol time spent by people who are running artistic activities, uh, you know, they, they get incredibly efficient at, at doing, uh, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day procedures. At a meeting happens, it's 25 minutes long, everything that has to happen happens and they're gone. But there's no humanity to them. It's all content. And there's no exchange of, of, of something that, that I have found in doing dramaturgy is, is really useful. Uh, it's one of the things I think uh, people like Craig Lucas and, and David Wong valued most in Oscar is a guy to hit the ball back, just to sit and talk about their plays. Not that Oscar, or, or because I hope I do that as well, and John does, not that we come up with the answers, but maybe because of the conversation, something occurs to the writer that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. And, and that takes time. It just does. You, and, and it can't be... You know, I've got a 2.30, so this, you know, we have to fix your act in 12 minutes. Uh, that, that, to me, is, is the danger of where we're going. We, as we become more and more and more efficient, we become less and less and less human in terms of how we deal with artistry. Uh, I'm going to throw out another one for you, and then I'm hoping you will all come in on all of this stuff. So that's why I'm getting him to talk on multiple topics, and then we'll, we'll open it up. Uh, I have two more topics. In the beginning, Polly um, introduced this, um, this session with that quote that I found really provocative. I want to get it right. Um, so this is from the, the, the establishment. John, maybe you have a sense of this, too. Establishment of that program originally at Yale. The goals of the program are to resolve the antipathy between the intellectual and the practical and diffuse the two into an organic whole. In your experience, is that is there that antipathy? Is is the intellectual life <laughs> antithetical? Or what is that? What? How do you make that a verb? Antipathetical <laughs> uh, to the academic life. Is that so? So that's a stated purpose of creating this role in the theater to fuse the intellectual uh, life with the practical uh, artistic practice, as if it's missing. Uh, and it says earlier in that paragraph about how there, there was a dearth of intellectual rigor in the artists. Mm -hmm. Is that a necessary function right now? Do you feel like that's a relevant, um, what do you call it, dialectic between intellectual and artistic in the American way? You know, I can't go at it that way, if that makes any sense. It's, it's, it's a casebook example of what I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, um, when I came to work at the Globe, Jack O'Brien gave me the coast of Utopia. He says, this is way too long. Cut it. <laughs> <laughs> and I read it, and I gave it back. And I said, I'm not cutting Tom Stoppard. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a of mine. Uh, uh, and and I, it's been my good fortune to, to spend some time with Stoppard. You know, and, and wonderful about conversation, but I'm not going to, you know, walk in as, as the intellectual rigor guy and, and, you know, with him or anybody else. Uh, I, I just don't think you can do it that way. Uh, you, you start having a conversation with the writer about their play and, and what's in the play is, is what the intellectual rigor is. And there are times, uh, not infrequent, when the intellectual rigor of the play is less than it could be. But the conversation can help to amplify that. And it's, it, you're not, you know, you don't set out to do that, but if it happens, it's cool. So, you know, I, it, the conversation's the thing. Yeah, well, it, yeah. there's the function yeah. and there's the way it applies. Yeah. Um, I, I go back to what Polly was quoting also. Can, can just make sure I hear that. The function and the label? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, she talked about the, the idea that we're the conscience of a theater. My first job was in this building, well, not this building, but that building. And I'm not going to come in here and tell Zelda Fitchhand where I'm here to be your conscience. Thank you very much. Uh, nor will I say that to David Martin uh, or Mark Masterson, who's now running the theater. But I think there is a value in having someone who 
uh, whose primary purpose is to be conscious of the intellectual rigor of what we're doing, even though everybody else in the room also is trying to be aware of that too. They just have a million other things they're also thinking about. So, so the function may exist, but I think it's a mistake to walk into the room and say, hey, I'm here to be the intellectual rigor guy or the yeah. conscience guy. Well, well that, that, and, and, and let me just add on to that. To the extent that we played that role, uh, it was times like when we got into it with the LA Times and, and uh, over a critical thing and some other stuff, uh, or, or Noah Heidel's play, uh, Mr. Marmalade, when it was done, uh, and you know people were freaking out, and literally on the editorial pages of the Orange County Register, the play was condemned before in previews <laughs> as, as something because there was a child portrayed, admittedly by a 25-year-old actor, but. You know, this kind of thing, in that case, we were not intellectual rigor for the artist, but rather in defense of the artist to the community. And I think there is a role for that, for, for the yes, people okay. who do our job. But, but the idea that, you know, you're, you're, you're doing that for a playwright is, I, th I think, presumptuous. Well, and this, okay, so then this should be provocative. Because <laughs> I, I found it very uh, provocative in reading this uh, thing. And I'm embarrassed to say, I also came up through, um, just through practice. And, and uh, just, you know, a guy wanting to direct plays when I, when I landed in San Francisco. And, and so I just started going. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to say right here in front of God and everybody that these two pieces of writing that Polly's talking about, I only read in preparation for this convening. I've been working in this field for 20 plus years. And these are new pieces of writing to me. They're 25 years old, they're foundational. I didn't know them, I'm working along. One of the things that shocked me was this notion that the, that the writer, that the, that the artist in the room would need and invite a critic into the making of the art. When I read it, it felt like, well, if you're, the, that role is actually between the audience and the production not between the artists and the production. Like the, the production is the art. That's what everybody's working on it. But if you're inviting a critic into that process, it seems like it's a critic, you're making your, your case for a critical dialogue between you and your audience. You're giving your audience the capacity to understand what you're doing mm -hmm. as a theater, as opposed to leaving it to Isherwood or Peter Marks, hello Peter, um, uh, to, to decide for you what your institution is trying to do with your audience. You're, you're actually serving that function with your audience yeah. more than with the artist. And, and, and if you look at how you're articulating this, what's absent from all these role descriptions is humanity. Okay? Uh, I, I mean, you, you finally have to have a relationship with artists you work with first, or nothing happens. Uh, I mean, the critic has no relationship with the playwright, ideally. Uh, it was an interesting uh, observation to, to what extent do we meet with critics. Uh, Dan Sullivan, who was the critic in the Los Angeles Times, not the director. Uh, I used to meet with Dan once a year at the O'Neill, where I think he still runs the critics lab up there, doesn't he? He does. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, Dan reviewed South Coast Repertory, you know, nine or ten times a year, and we never had a conversation in Los Angeles. We would always spend 90 minutes or so every summer under a tree at the O'Neill, and I would tell him why he was wrong, and he would tell me why we were wrong. And no holds barred for a couple of hours, one day in the summer, and then no, no discussion. And I, I thought that was one of the most useful things uh, in that sense, because you could articulate all of your concerns and, and the beliefs that you had about how you'd been not well served by the paper. And they could come back with what they felt you, you were uh, short on, what, what you had. So it's a good way to work. So it's a nice thing to do, but you almost have to take it out of the context of the institution. And then each side goes back to their institution and what they do. All right, I have a, I have a story that I'm going to have to interview you about later because I really want to get it on the record. But I want to give other people time because I'm hogging your time. Uh, questions for Jerry about on this topic uh, or comments about stuff that you've heard so far. Let's get to you guys um, because this is not uh, a seminar. This is a, a gathering, a working group. Yes, Nan. You mentioned um, early on your desire and, and the importance of finding a playwright 
that you liked who, and taking him forward. Something that I'm greatly concerned about, how we continue to advocate for playwrights when we're in institutional theaters with artistic visions. Can you talk a little more about that and how you're doing that now? Well, it's interesting. I, I mean, you, you. First of all, I, I, th I think the commission is the most powerful tool the literary office has to support a writer. A production, obviously, is great, but first they have to write the thing. And uh, it was interesting. We gave David Wong his first commission, I think, in 1982. He was still just graduating from Stanford, and David. David's father ran the biggest Chinese-American bank in the United States. He didn't need the money. But what it did for him was authenticate him as a writer. And, and that means a tremendous amount to, to the young person coming out. Uh, what, what have we done with David? I think I just Golden Child, I think, right? We, we commissioned him after Golden Child, and uh, he oh. said, I'll write your play, but I don't need the money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting because the, uh, a writer like David goes away from you because Disney wants him and, and Joe Papp wanted him and, and Jory wanted him from Louisville. And, and so that's okay, too, because they go out and, and, and they're getting work. Other writers, like Richard Greenberg, we commissioned, I think, ten times in a row. And the point for us was we thought Rich needed to be supported because he was one of the best writers we knew. And I, I, I think that's all that, that, that you can do, is find the writers that you think are in the front rank of the people working, and, and you don't know who they are. You know, I, I mean, over a period of time, we knew Rich Greenberg was that. Over a period of time, uh, you know, Karen came in through, through our Hispanic Playwrights Project. Amy has been commissioned at, at South Coast a number of times. And, and, and it's, you know, as, as those relationships progress, you, you keep the support going. But, you know, how, how that works now in New York is very funny. Uh, New York is dead, but New York's coming around for some reason. Uh, the idea of play development, Kristen helped me out with this, it, it doesn't exist in New York the way it exists in the regions. I mean, uh, we worked on the WID. Uh, I met Maggie Edson in 89 or somewhere, no, 91, and, and we worked on the play through 94, I think, and did the play in 95, and, and that just doesn't happen in New York, you know, where the play is almost three hours long and it ends up being one act in, in, in 90, 95 minutes or uh, that kind of thing. You don't do that kind of work. It's thumbs up or thumbs down do a reading and that's it. And there's a reason for that. There really is. It's, it's not necessarily hostility. And I maybe Sanford and you guys do a little more of that. A little bit more. Maybe. Yeah, we're starting to, but nothing like we did at South Coast, where, where we would, you know, work years on plays. But also yeah. the, the funding for that activity has changed in New York as well. Because yeah. when I worked in the Theater Club over 10 years ago, right. we did a lot of it and none of it was going anywhere. Uh, and so there was, there was a paradigm shift within that uh, okay. To some degree. I well, I, I think it's going back in that direction. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's it's very interesting. So going back to your to your point, uh, part of the difficulty in New York is is branding stuff in a particular way, so that a show that's on in your second space, Christian, is the bar should not be up here. Right. It, should, it should be here, and critics and everybody else has to understand that. And it's tough when it's in New York, and particularly if you've got Simon Russell Beale <laughs> in the cast, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, uh, but they need to understand that. So, uh, I don't know, it's, a, it's, it's harder to do it, honestly, in New York. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, there, there are places now, because I've gotten out and worked some different places, uh, uh, there, there are theaters like Tanya's uh, that's got the best of everything. You know, they, they, they've got resources, they've got a great city to work in, they're not in New York, and, but they can go to New York if they want, and they've got something that belongs there, and, and that's, that's a really nice way to work. New York has, carries a lot of pressure, but it doesn't exist.
Yeah, Natalie. Um, I'm curious, as a person who's been around to kind of watch the regional landscape pop up, it seems to me that the literary office is largely a function of the nonprofit theater. Number one, would you agree with that? And number two, there's this conversation of the commercial world and the nonprofit world are sort of merging together. And where do you see the literary office fitting into that? There, there are people working for commercial producers the, who have my title, right? Uh, director of Artistic Development or Creative Director. Or, uh, I think Jack Rattel was one of the first at Jujansen from Rocco. And, uh, and now all the producers have them. Uh, Eric Weisler's got somebody, Stuart Thompson's got somebody, our friends, and they're all sort of going to that literary office model. But, you know, it very quickly gets kind of taken away, and, and that, that's not bad. Uh, that's another thing, going back to that staff officer example, I mean, you, you, your job is to bring it in to, to help it grow, and then ultimately somebody else is going to realize it. You know, that, that just is, is how it works. So with WIT, Martin Benson directed the first production of WIT, and it, it fell to Mark to, to realize that play, even though I had spent two and a half years, you know, talking to Maggie about it. So, I mean, that's just the way the work gets done. And, and so, uh, that's not how it happens in New York theater. In New York theater, particularly commercial theater, if you find a property you want to do, the first person you hire is the director. And directors are very territorial about their work in, in New York, wouldn't you say? I mean, in the sense of, at, given the work that we do. Once it goes to the director, uh, unless they know you, you know, it's taken me three years to get Doug Hughes to take me seriously. You know? <laughs> and, and, and it's just because Doug's had a lot of bad experiences. I, I get it, you know, as to, as to why that is. But, you know, that's the reality. And it's well, very but, different than from what's out in the region. But is that function that you're talking about there, is that the literary manager or is that the dramaturg? Okay, and so, and Madeline, are you asking also about the literary office itself in the commercial world? And what's your sense, do you have a sense of it from where you're looking, or you haven't been able to see into there yet? Where my brain is with that question is there's a lot of talk about kind of nonprofits having an identity crisis these days, and if, if sort of nonprofits don't know where they are, is the whole system kind of breaking down, and what happens to the literary office if that happens? Are we just a product of the nonprofit theater, or are we essential to the happening of theater everywhere? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting on that phone call Morgan talks, she tells a great story. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, it's, it's probably like 20 minutes in. But she tells the story that she tells frequently, which is when she went into, um, she had, there was a play, I don't know, maybe she was calling you, or I guess she was calling Maine. Um, there was a play that the public had commissioned, and. Uh, spent some time developing, but Joe Papp wasn't going to produce it, and he said, you know, call the playwright, let them know. And instead, she called somebody, a colleague in a literary office at another theater, and said, we're not going to do the play, maybe you want to do it. And Joe kind of called her on the carpet, because she was acting like an agent. And he said, uh, I'm sorry if most of you listened to the call, but um, he said to her, you know, you're acting like an agent, you work for the public theater. And the way she says it, no, I, Joe, I actually, I work for the American theater, I work at the public. And, uh, you know, in the end of the story, as she told me originally, is the way I like to believe it, um, he understood that immediately. Now, on the phone call, she implies something else, maybe <laughs> the latter is true. <laughs> but I think it's the way a lot of us feel, that we work, for the, we work for the American theater, and we happen to work through an institutional context. So are we working, is that institutional context, does the American theater include the commercial theater, or are they separate when we say that? Uh, and, and to what extent does the literary uh, work that we do in in these institutional contexts uh, a contribution to the whole, or is it even necessary at the point of a commercial? But I, I would argue in that case, Morgan was working for the playwright, and 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 uh, that's what I think you do. Above everything, you have to take that up and, and champion the writer and defend the writer. Uh, ideally, then you have to believe in the writer, right? And that's going back to the first thing. So, so find people you really believe in and stick with them. That's, if, if we all do that, and because we all have different ideas, then the American theater will get served. 
I mean, I do confess, I'm more concerned, I, I, I know, I think Liz, uh, I, I think when we were at Louisville, it may have been you, or it was, or a it from, it was. from <laughs> Minneapolis, <laughs> we were talking about doing stuff that was local, mm -hmm. that, that realizing local things with local emphasis, <clears throat> and, and uh, great, I think it, with somebody like Liz Engelman making that point, this, that's going to get served. My concern is, I think we've lost you know, as divided as this country is, and as much as theater is supposed to build community, where are the plays that bring us all together? The ones that can be done in Miami, in New York, in Baltimore, in San Francisco, in Seattle. Who's writing those plays? And I don't see enough of them. I really don't. Uh, it's interesting. England is more compressed. They're able to do it better than we are right now. And it's not surprising because we, we live in a splintered society. We are fraction. But who are, who are the artists that can pull us back together? Yeah. Let me pull on you, Rachel, right there, because you just sort of stated your mission in a way. Aren't you the, as in your uh, ensemble the theater of the emerging American moment? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> how do you do that? I mean, we're, we're an enormous fractured society. How do you, how do you approach it even? Um, I mean, I, uh, well, we approach it often through, um, through a region. Uh, mm -hmm. We have found past number of our works. It wasn't something we intentionally did, but we found that we were latching on to a piece of the geography and sort of using it as a lens. So uh, Mission Drift, our last work, we researched in Las Vegas for a month. Adrian was there for a part of that and was a dramaturg in the room for a device process where, yes, we are aggressively inviting the critic into the room, actually pretty um, consciously. Um, uh, uh, and then, our casting out from that geographic location into elements of mythology and history, that's going to essentially create an echo chamber, uh, hopefully, and uh, through, through the layering, kind of look at the current moment through distinct elements of the past. So we've used Gone with the Wind uh, to look at Hurricane Katrina and the aftermath. Um, and uh, using Las Vegas and sort of not so much the gambling culture, but the building and busting of Las Vegas as a, uh, the fastest growing city in America at the turn of the millennium. Um, using that against the Dutch settlement of New Amsterdam to sort of look at the founding mythology and whether American freedom is inextricable from the freedom to make as much money as possible. So. Um, so it's, I think, trying to have both a, a, a distinctly short view of a particular place and then trying to scope back and situate that in a really, really large canvas, often too large. And I'm, I'm more interested in work that is too large rather than too small. I'm really impressed that you were able to just sort of come up with that whole answer out of the blue with me poking at you. Working on the creative capital grant. I see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have time for one more question, and then we have to go on. Yeah, Christian. Uh, Rachel was saying, because that the sort of too large question, I think, the, is, it, is interesting to me, because I think the question of um, applying intellectual rigor to plays has often manifested it, itself in bad dramaturgy, and so far as we have encouraged, we have, as Richard Nelson suggests, encouraged plays to be too tight and to be too neat and to conform to sort of our structural um, instincts um, in a way that doesn't always serve the core vision of those plays. That's bad dramaturgy. It may be sound structure, but what we, we aren't always doing is um, look, taking a long view, actually past the playwright, to the play itself, to, to apply intellectual rigor to, uh, uh, to create the most um, uh, engaging play moment to moment that then is sufficiently complex, actually, or not sufficiently uh, exceptional complex, um, so, that, so that you're actually trusting the audience to follow you, as opposed to sort of squeezing something into a box that looks nice, so that the audience feels good about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to read something. This is, again, it's part of my own um, surprise at, at what I didn't already, hadn't already read. But um, this is from that Doug Anderson article. That, how many people have read that Doug Anderson article? Oh, interesting. Yeah, read it. It's amazingly um, pro it's prophetic in a way that's really disturbing. 
Sure, we can mail it to people. We can email it to people. I'm sure, it, I don't know, are we allowed to just send it around? I don't, uh, I don't even know what <laughs> book it's from. It's from something called New Play Development. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's from the Drama Review. Uh, but anyway, this is, this is Rob Fall, uh, Bob Falls in, uh, well, in 1989. Uh, and he's talking about a specific, uh, the, the kind of workshop process. As they go through the process, plays start to look like other plays. You start clarifying dramatic action, eliminating unnecessary things. You start talking about the arc of the play, and anything that's wildly original or wildly unrealistic is thrown out. I was at a major workshop last summer. It was very strongly actor-oriented. What interests me is that if plays do not come into the festival as realistic works. They leave as realistic works. <laughs> Actors are essentially realistic artists. 99% of them want to know how to get from A to B to C to D, which they need to do. They need these psychological underpinnings in order to create the role. But if the playwright comes to them with a play that for some reason does not have the psychological underpinnings, well, at this festival, the, actual, the actors could demand that of the playwright. So the plays were actually rewriting, the, the playwrights were actually rewriting the plays to accommodate the actors. I can't say whether the plays got better or worse, but they did get more realistic. And, and in a way, what you're talking about, about the intellectual rigor that gets applied or the things that get applied external to, can push a play in a particular direction, but is that what, is that progress? Is that direction progress? Well, when you have to be able to recognize a playwright's voice. And when you start taking the voice away, you, you know, our thing was always uh, the, the medical deal, first do no harm. And, and uh, you start taking the voice away and, and you're, you're killing the life. It's, it's where, where the art came from. But, so, I, but I'm struck that this is, so when we all hear that, we go, oh, you know, not along, and yeah, that makes so much sense that, that they, they, this thing happened, they did get more realistic, is that necessarily better? And this is 1985, or 1989, that this um, piece was published, and I think it's still something we're not sure we're doing well. No, I, I absolutely agree, but the, the other presumption of what I just said is that the playwright has a voice. And all playwrights don't. Okay, and that's the important thing about who you pick. You know, who, who you're going to back. Because uh, uh, the worst thing you situation in my experience. You, you mean the, not all playwrights have a a voice in terms of an authentic voice as an artist, not necessarily yeah. a voice in the process. Yeah, no, no, a, a voice as an artist. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, in the sense of part of the skill now in writing long form television, which is enjoying a golden age is being able to write in the voice of the writer who created the project. And that's a different skill than what we have in theater, I think. Uh, and, and so there are people doing that kind of work who are really good at it, you know, uh, who are terrific at what happens next and coming up with that. And we like that. We, we, we like to follow that kind of writing. Uh, but, you know, a Joe Orton voice, uh, something that comes along, a uh, uh, Krista Rank voice, something that's, that's so original and distinctive, they're not going to write plays like everybody else. And, and you, have to, you have to protect that and not cut it off. And the most discouraging thing you can get into is doing a play with a writer that has no voice, that isn't perfect, and so then you start giving these notes. And, and that's how it turns out like that, and everybody goes home unhappy. Really not a good experience. So the looking for the voice, looking for the, what you're just talking about, that is that is what you were originally hired at South to recognize David Mamet when he came. Yeah, you can put it that way. I, I, I you know, it, we weren't that skilled. We were just, it, it, you know what I mean? You, you just kind of, uh, you're reading all this stuff. Uh, my face, I, I tend, like I say, I go back to poetry. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I learn by going where I have to go. That's Theodore Ritke and Bill and Alan Brown. One of the best ways to live on young. And, and it's the end. Yeah, so. We're going to stop there. I, would, I want to say thank you very much for everything you've done. Polly scared everything. the hell out of me with her narcissism. And I hope I haven't <laughs> seen it. I think it's enormously helpful to, for you to share it. I, I know it's been enormously inspiring.